mystery thrives in darkness. The things you cannot see are the things you can never quite understand. That's when fear sets in. How does fear change you? How does understanding change you? These thoughts haunted a particularly curious freshman journalism student at Winchester Phillips University. Tonight, as went most nights, he was abandoned by his roommates who put off the first semester's wait to drink the night away. This future Carl Bernstein, as he imagined himself, decided to get an early start on the Winchester Journal assignment his editor had thrown at him. Most of the school's newspaper writers would have complained this weekend, but this kid was in his seventh heaven. Winchester's rush weekend was in full swing. Every fraternity and sorority used the week to finalize their list of pledges, and the parties were a final celebration. A college newspaper job was his dream all throughout high school, and it was rare for a freshman to have this much freedom. He was the youngest editor of his high school's newspaper and the first to be African-American. He kept that position for two years despite run-ins with the administration. His work challenged the student body to face issues of race, politics, and even the school administrator's lack of leadership. Luckily, at Winchester Phillips University, this young journalist had the support of a scholarship from the journalism department and an application that spoke volumes. The dean of the department hailed his application as, quote, one of the best of the last decade, unquote, and, quote, proof that a new generation of insightful journalism was approaching, unquote. The Winchester Journal took notice, and before he knew it, the future Carl Bernstein was writing fiery pieces for the journal. The beeping sound of garage band echoed through the empty 403 Trout Fisher Hall, alerting him that the mic was hot. While most of the student journalists typed out their notes, he recorded his thoughts to help fuel the writing process. His lips inched closer to a USB condenser mic plugged into his MacBook. Maximilian Carter here. It's 11.46 p.m. October 5th. It's a Saturday night, and once again, I've denied my roommate's weekly invitation to, as they say, get shwasted, dude. <sighs> Max rolled his eyes. Instead, I'm here with you folks. Well, if this recording comes out, I'll be with... I mean, uh, you get the point. <laughs> he gave off a tired laugh. Max was toying with the idea of publishing his audio notes with the articles, but was hesitant. He ran his fingers through his nappy curls, as his brother called them, and adjusted his black glasses. He gave his unnecessarily large calves a scratch and leaned toward the mic. My topic to discuss this week is Greek organizations. Why do they exist? Obviously to serve the community, right? The sarcasm was intensified by his tired voice. Well, fraternities and sororities are a staple of the college experience. Films, television shows, and novels are just some of the mediums that have brought their stories to life, positive or negative, mostly negative, I won't complain. You're probably wondering why I was given this assignment after my critical article about Greek fundraising. Me too. Are Greek organizations helping the community or is it just a popularity cut? I won't go there. I will say that these organizations have always intrigued me. I spent most of my high school years obsessing over Dan Brown's work, Angels and Demons, The Lost Symbol, The Da Vinci Code, you can't forget movies and TV shows like National Treasure and America's Book of Secrets. <laughs> what do all these things have in common? They involve stories of men behind closed doors initiating their members in bizarre rituals. White men of power and prestige meeting in secrecy identified by ancient symbols. The Illuminati, the Knights Templar, the Freemasons, and the list goes on. 
Obviously, college Greek organizations are quite different, <laughs> very different actually, but there's a similarity, the secrecy and the ritualistic initiations. The drinking of wine from a human skull, a favorite of the Freemasons, has been replaced with shot glasses. The 33rd degree Freemasons reflect on life and death in a chamber while the Omega Boys, well, they reflect on how to get off the floor after too many. <laughs> I'm not here to demonize Greek life. They intrigue me, particularly because no matter where you are on this campus, no one will speak a negative word about them in public. Not to mention the idea of hazing. A group of young men and women bonding through the act of communal torture. Yes, I said it. What an insane concept. But interesting enough for an investigative journalist like me. <laughs> he laughed. I'll never know what happens behind the walls of those houses. Well, a slight smile grew on his face. <laughs> Maybe I will. Chapter 1. The Omega Psi Beta House on Marden Street was in a complete frenzy. The fraternity's rush process was coming to an end, and the final initiation was at play. This tradition was a final challenge known as the Four Points. The infamous challenge, or hazing as critics called it, involved pledges running to four main points in the Omega House. They ran from the foyer around and back. At each point, the pledges consumed excessive amounts of alcohol with an especially strong shot laced with a secret ingredient at the fourth point. The fourth point is where the pledge's future big, their mentor, would create a concoction that would truly test their ability to stay off the floor. All this occurring in the midst of a lively crowd of onlookers. The party was a final celebration to see who would be strong enough to become a member of the Omega Brotherhood. The first round of pledges sped through tight openings where partygoers chanted vigorously at their favorite contenders. The ritual felt more like a distorted Olympic triathlon. At the fourth point, the first batch of pledges began guzzling down liquor. The midnight cutoff was coming soon, so the stragglers sped from the third point before their chance ran out. Three of those stragglers were Evan Saunders, Parker Lawson, whose brother was the fraternity's vice president, and Antonio Ricci. Evan was the shortest of the bunch, but Antonio reminded him that his long James Bay hair made up for it in the ladies' department. Parker and Antonio were the giants of the friend group, as Evan called them. Parker was 6'1", with light brown hair and blue eyes, and Antonio was the same height with dirty blonde curls on top, sides faded and blue eyes. The three amigos, as some of the brothers called them, were the greatest contenders. Parker, because of his blood connection, Evan, because his brother Calvin went alum after graduating as president, Antonio, or Tony as they called him, had made quite a name for himself. He was accepted to Winchester on a presidential scholarship and was one of the medical school's brightest freshmen. He knew that if he could get into Winchester's most well-known fraternity, his job opportunities and connections would be golden. Unfortunately, Antonio was falling behind. The alcohol was getting to him, and he had stumbled to the floor multiple times. People in the crowd helped pick him up and playfully shoved him forward. Someone yelled, don't screw the pooch, Ricci. A Delta girl in the back called out, Ricci, if you can finish this, I'll be your prize tonight. Laughter erupted from the crowd. Antonio slipped and attempted to grab onto a chair to hoist himself up. His body was almost limp and his eyes had lost their charming luster. One of the members from an opposing fraternity snatched the chair and Antonio stumbled to the ground. Get up, Omega boy. Get runner, get wrecked. A group of other guys around him began laughing and taunting him. Evan, who was almost to point four, heard the fall and turned back. Reluctantly, he ran back and hoisted Antonio up and carried him through the crowd. He smacked Antonio in the face and shook him. Come on, Tony, don't screw yourself. Don't be a pussy. You're almost there. Antonio gave a slight nod and stumbled along on Evan's arm. 
They both hurried toward the door to a back room where the point four concoctions had been set. Parker was just finishing his drink and stormed into the next room. The roar of the crowd muffled as Evan pulled Antonio through the door and snatched the shot glass with his name on it. Evan inhaled the drink and slapped the table to get Antonio's attention. Dude, snap out of it and drink the damn shot. We got like four minutes. Antonio shook his head in an attempt to snap out of his trance and fumbled through an array of empty shot glasses. All he could see was a fuzzy blur as the room spun. He gripped the table and tried to find the shot with his name on it. Antonio lifted it and drank it down. His eyes squinted hard from the strength of the drink. Hurry up or I'm leaving you, shouted Evan. Evan turned around and made his way toward the door. Antonio yelled, wait, and struggled to make his way to the door. Suddenly, he felt a light chill run through his body and his limbs began to lose feeling. He tried to grip the table's edge, but his hand gave out and his body began to fall. In that single moment, Antonio felt the room blur to darkness. His head slammed against the table and his body hit the cold floor. Evan felt as if time stopped. He turned around and saw Antonio and his eyes shot wide. He ran to him yelling, Tony, Tony, oh my God, are you okay? Tony, can you hear me? Evan yelled toward the other room, someone help, seriously, Tony is hurt. A crowd of pledges that had finished stormed in with party goers following. One of the pledges pulled out his iPhone and started filming discreetly. Parker shoved his way to the front and kneeled down in front of Antonio. Shit. Tony, dude, get up, said Parker. The crowd grew silent and the music disappeared. One of the pledges called out, oh shit, he looks dead as fuck. Parker looked over at Evan. What happened? I don't know. I told him to come on and the minute I turned, I heard a loud bang. I think he hit his head. Evan responded. I gotta call my brother, Parker said. A pledge yelled out, shouldn't we call the cops? He looks trashed and not in a good way. What? And get arrested? Someone call Chad, said Evan. Evan thought long and hard about the possibility of police involvement, but also feared for Antonio's health. It was an inner battle laced with anxious thoughts that started to make his hand shake. He tried to ball them up to make it unnoticeable. Parker pulled out his phone and called Eric. One of the other pledges called Chad, the fraternity's president. Eric, hello? Listen, we got an emergency at the house. Come back now, said Parker. Chad just said he's on his way from the Sigma house. He'll be here in two, said one of the pledges. Parker hung up the phone and pulled Antonio on his side. Maybe he's just a little out of it. My friends on the rugby team knock their heads in all the time, said the fraternity brother that pushed him down earlier. Evan looked up at Parker and said, maybe we should take him downstairs or something? Like, get him from up here? Antonio let out a painful moan. Tony boy, get up, laughed one of the pledges. At least he's not dead, chimed another. The tense mood grew lighter, and the group of pledges helped Parker and Evan lift Antonio. They carried him downstairs and laid him on a couch where a group of girls had just left. Pete Collins, the treasurer, and Connor Harris, the fraternity secretary, made their way downstairs. Pete and Connor were the foundations of the Omega executive members. Pete was short with black hair, and Connor towered over him at 6'2 with blonde hair and ocean blue Sinatra eyes, as the brothers called them. What the fuck happened to Ricci? said Pete. He wiped out at point four. I think he hit his head, Evan responded. Is it swollen? Pete chimed back. Evan touched Antonio's head and felt a large bump and nodded yes. Shit, said Connor. Chad ran down the stairs. Eric followed close behind him. Eric bent down next to the couch looked at Antonio, then whispered something to Chad. Eric and Chad were the capstones of the Omega Brotherhood. 
Eric's light brown hair and blue eyes mirrored his younger brother, Parker. Chad was a bit taller with dark brown hair and brown eyes. He had the sharp wits of his father and the devilish handsome looks of a movie star. The brothers were exchanging nervous glances when suddenly Antonio let out another moan and grew silent. Should we like call the police? He could get brain damage, said Parker. No, I'm not having a bunch of cops in here. Plus, how are we gonna explain this to them? Eric yelled back with a worried face. He was starting to feel the true intensity of what could happen. Let's give him some space. Let him sleep it off, Chad said. Evan put some ice on his head. He'll be all right, guys. He's just a little out of it. It happens to all of us. All the pledges made their way toward the stairs and Chad whistled to catch their attention. None of you say anything. If anyone asks, just say he's clumsy and drunk. I don't want word getting around. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir, Brother Rivers, they chanted in unison. The group swiftly made their way back to the party while Eric followed, keeping his worried expression. The music upstairs returned to its previous volume. Parker got up and took one more look at Antonio before leaving, while Chad made his way over to Evan. Listen, he'll be okay. I trust that you won't say anything. Give him his ice and let him sleep it off. He's just a clumsy dick, Chad remarked. Look, I knocked my shit in real good freshman year too. Chad pulled his hair back and pointed to a scar on his head. Evan looked up and gave a slight smirk. He'll be all right, man. Chad got up and walked toward the stairs. Don't let it get to your head. Yes, Brother Rivers. Chad made his way upstairs, taking a deep breath. Evan followed looking back with concern, then ran upstairs to grab the ice. The night had turned sour, but that was just the beginning. Chapter Two An alarm rang from Max's iPhone. He ignored the first few rings until his roommate Carson banged on the wall. Dude, shut that shit off. Max got up groggily and looked at his iPhone. He turned off the alarm and looked over at Carson and said, Hey Carson, I was getting shwasted last night. Carson rolled over and said, Shut up. Max laughed and looked back at his phone and noticed a text from his friend Hunter that read, we gotta talk. Don't tell Haley. It's super secretive. But I gotta tell someone. Max sat up straight and texted him back. Okay, where should we meet? He waited, tapping his fingers and looking around. Hunter never texted him like this unless it was something serious. Why is he keeping something from Haley? Something weird is going on. A message pinged from Hunter. Let's meet at my dorm. My roommates are gone for the weekend. Why is Hunter being so secretive? Max thought. He got up, got dressed, slipped his laptop into his signature brown messenger bag, and headed toward the door. Max checked himself out in the large mirror next to the bathroom and patted down his curly frohawk. He stood on the balls of his feet and thought, maybe I'll get a little taller. He read a study that teenage boys grow a little after 18. He was clocking in at 17, but his brother Christian busted his bubble one Thanksgiving dinner when he said, I think you're stuck at 5'10", bro. <laughs> Just accept it. Hearing that from someone that was 6'2", didn't make Max feel any better. He pulled his cross necklace from under his hoodie, and on the way out, he ran back to the room and asked Carson, Want anything while I'm out? Carson leaned up, his eyes crusted, black hair messy, and face disheveled. No. Max smiled and closed the door. On the way to the tower, the largest residential commons on campus, he took out his phone and opened Twitter. Hunter didn't tell him, but he had a hunch that his friend was pledging a fraternity. One big clue 
was the fact that Max asked him to hang out last night and his excuse was, sorry, I have a meeting with my young athletic professionals club. Haley texted Max last night and said she saw Hunter heading toward fraternity sorority row. Haley lives in Lincoln Hall on North Campus and had a direct view of Martin Street. Max found it interesting that Hunter was conveniently on Martin Street the night of the Omega's big party. He had no idea what happened between those walls, but everyone on campus knew it was happening. It's the last party before the fraternity announced their new members. The Winchester Journal publishes a full-page ad where the fraternity includes headshots of the new brothers in their signature maroon blazers. The blazers were worn by the new members on their first day on campus as members of the Omega Brotherhood and during special events. The maroon blazers are a symbol of the campus hierarchy. To wear one meant that you had been through insane trials and tribulations. People respected the blazers because if you did what it took to get one, you were forged in fire. Max typed Omega Winchester in the Twitter search box, and nothing came up. He swiped through the Winchester Secrets page, and nothing there either. Wow, they keep this party wrapped tight, don't they? Max almost gave up. He was getting close to the tower's side entrance when he found a page that belonged to Rami626. Max was attracted to the post because it had the tag words Omega and Exposed. Max clicked on the post and it read, Someone in the Omega party last night filmed this. Click the link to watch. We have to expose this college cult. Someone could have died. Max was hesitant about clicking sketchy links. The profile picture was the Guy Fox mask. This guy is either a creeper or a future activist. Guess I'll find out, Max thought. He clicked the link, which took him to a Reddit page with a video attached. He clicked on the video, and when it opened, Max's mouth flew open. The video showed Antonio Ricci looking lifeless on the floor next to a table. The camera panned up and showed Parker Lawson shoving his way to the front of the crowd, kneeling and saying, Oh shit, Tony, dude, get up. Evan Saunders was heard in the background explaining what happened to Antonio. Someone mentioned that they should call the cops, and Evan responded, What? And get arrested? Someone called Chad. Suddenly, the shot flipped vertical, and the video ended. He probably made the call, Max thought. It was something familiar about the voice that said they should call the police. It was muffled, but Max swore it sounded like Hunter. Evan walked in the Omega house, and it was silent. Everyone is still sleeping, he thought. He walked through the foyer past a large wall of framed images of the current brothers in their maroon blazers. Once he got into the living room, he saw that the cups and chairs were gone. The normal furniture was back in its rightful place, like the party never happened. He walked into the back room where the incident happened, and felt a chill run down his spine. Evan made his way downstairs and saw Antonio on the couch. Walking over to him, he noticed vomit on the floor and his hand dropped off the side of the couch. Evan leaned down and tried shaking him. Tony? Tony, wake up! Dude, wake up! He pushed against his chest and shook him again. Tony? He checked his pulse. Nothing. Evan's eyes grew wide and he placed his hand under Antonio's nose. No breath. Oh no. Oh my God. Tony, wake up. Wake up. He shook him again and pressed against his chest. Evan started hyperventilating and ran upstairs yelling, Help! Help! Somebody come downstairs! He ran back to Antonio and heard the quick patter of footsteps charging toward the basement. Pete and Connor rushed downstairs and saw Evan in tears pressing on Antonio's chest. He won't get up. I can't find a pulse. Pete ran over and checked his pulse and felt nothing. 
Oh my God, he's unconscious, Pete said. Evan pulled out his phone and started to dial 911. Pete looked over and said, Hey, what are you doing? Calling for an ambulance, Evan responded. The cops will come too. We can't have them in here. I'll drive him to the hospital. Evan looked reluctantly. This is serious. We can't worry about... Evan cut him off and said, We can't have them in here. Period. I'll drive. Help me get him upstairs. Evan wiped his tears and grabbed one side of Antonio. Pete grabbed the other. They lifted him and stepped around the vomit and walked toward the stairs. Pete turned to Connor and said, Get some pledges to help with cleaning up down here, and we'll take him to Foster Hill. Keep your ringer turned up. Got it. Take care of him, Connor responded. A couple of members had crowded around the door at the top of the stairs and stared down at the scene. As Evan and Pete carried Antonio up the stairs, Connor grabbed Evan's shoulder and looked him in the eyes. He'll be okay. We've seen this before, Connor said. Evan looked at Pete, and they both shared a look that spoke louder than words. This is different. Max knocked on the door of Dorm 808. The door was covered in Hamilton-themed door decks. Max tried to convince his RA to make Da Vinci Code-themed door decks for the spring semester, but she thought it would be, quote, too dark, unquote. Max was not pleased, and the Hamilton door decks before him made his feelings about door decks even worse. She said no to musicals, too. Who doesn't like rapping founding fathers? The door flew open, and there he was. Hunter Toberski, the tall ginger lover boy of the tower. Max always said that he's what it would look like if Cameron Moynihan and Logan Lerman had a love child. Hunter had green eyes, and his freckled arms were on full display in his St. Matthew High School cross-country tank shirt. Unfortunately, his boyish charm was non-existent at the moment. He looked as if he'd seen a ghost. You look like death, Max said honestly. Hunter rubbed his eyes and motioned for him to come in. I feel like it too, he said, as he plopped down on his futon. Max took a seat on a beanbag chair next to a wall of movie posters. There were posters for everything from National Treasure to Remember the Titans. Max looked up and smiled at the Angels and Demons poster he bought for Hunter's birthday. The one thing they had in common was an intense love for that film. Max had seen Hunter reading the book in the lunchroom sophomore year of high school. He sat down and started a conversation with him, and they became instant friends. I feel like shit, Hunter moaned in a deep groggy voice. You look like it too, Max chimed back. Shut up, dick, Hunter said, laughing. Max laughed, then looked at his phone and grew serious. Hunter, I have a bad feeling about what you're about to tell me. Hunter looked at Max and slumped down with his hands clasped. He took a breath and said, Max, you can't tell anyone what I'm about to tell you. Evan sat in the lobby of Foster Hill Hospital, twiddling his thumbs and looking up at the nurse's station, hoping someone would come out. Hopefully with good news. Evan didn't tell Pete, but while going to the bathroom, he snuck and called Antonio's parents. They said they would rush to Winchester as soon as possible. Evan looked at Pete with eyes searching for answers. Pete gripped his shoulder and said, breathe. Evan closed his eyes, took a couple of deep breaths, and looked back at him. Pete, you're a pre-med student. Is it bad? Pete cracked his knuckles and took a breath. He's... he's not in a good place. I'm not a doctor yet, and God knows I shouldn't diagnose him, but... Let's just try to stay level-headed, okay? Evan nodded and closed his eyes until he heard a door whip open. Evan? He looked up, and it was Antonio's parents, Leonardo Ricci and Vanessa Ricci. 
They rushed over to Evan, and Vanessa hugged Evan with all her might. There wasn't a question of who Antonio got his features from. Vanessa was a hauntingly beautiful mirror of her son. She had long curly blonde hair and blue eyes. His father, Leo, had salt and pepper hair and a full beard. Antonio got his gentleness from his mother and his handsome charm from his father. That charm was not on display when Leo walked up to Pete. Where is he? Where is my son? Leo asked. Pete got up and extended his hand. Hello, Dr. Ricci. I'm Pete Collins, the Omega Treasurer. Leo looked down at Pete's hand, then back up at him, straight-faced. Pete awkwardly lowered his hand. What happened to my son? Sir, I assure you, Leo cut him off, I know what happened at that party. If he doesn't come out of this normal, we're going to have a problem. Pete looked at Evan, and Evan avoided eye contact. Vanessa noticed a female doctor walking their way. She extended her hand and greeted both Vanessa and Leo. I assume you're Antonio's parents? Yes, Leo responded. Where is my son? Is he okay? Leo asked with a stern but concerned tone. Sir, I feel that I should share this information with you and your wife in private, the doctor said. Vanessa looked at Leo with tears in her eyes. Leo took Vanessa's hand, and they followed the doctor to the back. Hunter leaned over Max's shoulder and watched the chaos unfold on the iPhone in front of him. He heard his voice echo from the background, and suddenly the video turned vertical and stopped. Hunter leaned back and closed his eyes. Hunter, this isn't good, Max said. I know, Hunter said as he opened his eyes. He looked at Max and said, Haley probably knows. Yeah, probably. Maybe we shouldn't meet together. That way I don't have to explain this twice, Hunter said. A knock came from the door. Max and Hunter looked at each other with question marks written on their faces. Hunter got up, walked over, and looked through the peephole. He looked back at Max with a surprised face and opened the door. Haley Rodriguez walked in wearing her nasty woman t-shirt, which meant she was about business. She was around Max's height with long, beautiful brunette hair, light brown skin, and strong cat eyeliner. She was a perfect combination of brains and beauty, but made it clear that she didn't have time for college boys. The world won't save itself. She met Hunter and Max during junior year of high school during the March for Our Lives protests. She was proud to be the first of her immediate family to go to college and the first Latinx student to receive a full ride to Winchester from their high school. She was one of the only people of color in the School of Art and Design. She's the sharpest knife in our drawer, Max always said. We gotta talk, she said as she welcomed herself in. Max looked at Hunter and Hunter cocked his head. Did you? Hunter said and Max quickly chimed back. No, sir. Haley sat down on the futon and Hunter sat next to her. So, uh, what's up, Omega boy? Hunter looked at her with squinted eyes. Okay, so does everyone know? Well, your voice came out loud and clear in that video, she responded. I had to listen a couple of times to be sure it was him, Max said. Really? Haley asked. I mean, he's got that fratty white boy voice, so like, he could have been any of them, Max said. Good point, good point, Haley said, smiling. Hunter straight-faced both of them. So the secret's out. The whole campus probably knows I pledged by now, Hunter said. Yeah, it got retweeted like a thousand times. Damn, I should have saved it before they took it down, Haley said. It's all good, I did, Max responded. Of course you did, Sherlock, Haley said with a calming smile. So, like, what does this do to the pledging process? Wait, 
the article. Max, are they publishing it? Hunter asked. I got a text from our assistant editor. I'm not supposed to know this, but apparently our editor pulled it five minutes before I got up here. At the request of Chad Rivers, Max said. Hunter's eyes grew wide. Oh, shit, Haley said, sitting straight up. He pulled it? Hunter said. Ain't it crazy that the pledges find out through an article with everyone else? Things are probably going to change this year, Haley said. Hunter sat back and closed his eyes. I guess I can explain myself now. I started the pledging process a month ago. It was so secret that I signed an NDA. You what? Haley yelled. Dude, you're joking, Max said. It's standard procedure for the Omega Brotherhood, internationally, Hunter said. This ain't your daddy's good old frat. This is some corporate shit, Haley said. Hunter rolled his eyes. Do your parents know about this? Max asked. My dad's an Omega, Hunter responded. All right, this makes sense now. Well, not for you. You're not like them, Max said. It's a family tradition. His father and his father's father were Omegas. We debated on it, but in the end, I had no choice, Hunter explained. Hunter, you can make your own choices now, Haley said. Not if I want his help getting a job after college. That's the Toberski family motto. Fall in line, and we'll keep you afloat. Defy us, and you drown. Hunter slumped down. Expand on this NDA business. What does it entail? Haley asked. I can't say anything about the... Rituals. The selection process. Basically, everything that happens between those walls is off limits. Unless the public is let in for some event. Which is rare, Max said, rolling his eyes. I remember my brother telling me once that he got in a fight with one of the Omegas at a bar. Hunter leaned up, and Haley lifted her eyebrow. Really? I can't imagine that ended well. They put my brother out of the bar and didn't say a word to the prick. Plus, the guy tried to get my brother expelled and lied about being attacked. Max took a breath. My brother said that the guy hurled the N-word at him and the administration didn't do anything. My mom had to get the NAACP involved just to keep Christian enrolled. I'm sorry, Max. That sucks, man, Hunter said. Not surprising at all, but hey, at least we have a black university president now. Maybe some real change will happen around here, Haley said, leaning over and rubbing Max's leg. Max grinned. Yeah, I hope so. It takes time, though. Especially when the whole school board is rich white men. Silence fell over the room, until suddenly Hunter's phone rang from the table. The number was unsaved, but he knew exactly who it was. He answered. As the call progressed, his face slowly grew pale. The call ended, and he looked at Max and Haley. He prepared to tell them something that he hoped he would never hear. Guys, Tony's dead. This is Hayes, Book One, an audiobook fiction podcast in six parts, written and narrated by me, Darius Buckley. For more information about Hayes, visit DariusStoryLab.com slash Hayes.